Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hello. Let's do it. Uh, Napoleon's first campaign, the defeat of Piedmont PMF Productions. Preemptive like, sure. 1796. Let's do it. I would, I would like to go through the Napoleon. I know a lot of people probably won't watch it because I've already done it. But I did it a really long time ago. And, and I kind of see it as my start to this whole history journey. I, I think... I think I might have done Alexander the Great prior, but it just didn't have as big of an impact. I, I will always remember the Epic History TV, Napoleon, Napoleonic War series, and then the Marshalls episodes after that. I will always remember that as like the, the, the start of a, of a big part of my channel. I don't, I, anyways, let's go. My name's Connor. Hello, friend. I like to watch things. I'm from New England. Which is this snug little corner of the U.S. in the Northeast. I'm talking way too much. Let's go, guys. If you're not ready to learn, there's the door. Home max down the hall. You're in the wrong class. Make me, uh, creep. Let's go. Phone's away. Europe, 1796. During four years of unremitting struggle, Revolutionary France has fought off the great powers of Europe, who fear that France's liberal ideals will spread to their empires. Desperate for military success, the Directory of France, which is neither competent nor popular, has decided to go on the offensive against Austria, the greatest threat to the French Republic. Guys, sorry, I gotta get my camera situated. Okay. I gotta go back 10 seconds. All right, deal with it. France, which is neither competent nor popular, has decided to go on the offensive against Austria, the greatest threat to the French Republic. Three armies are to converge and then advance on Vienna to end the war. But the corrupt directory neglects to supply its armies, and the commanders seldom cooperate leaving the offensive Jordan. doomed to failure. That is, until a brilliant young general arrives to take command of the southernmost army, the Army of Italy. 26 years old and untested in command. He's younger than me. His name is Napoleon Bonaparte, and he will change everything. My leader. A lack of government support, unpredictable payments to soldiers, and appalling conditions have reduced the French Army of Italy from over 100,000 soldiers down to 38,000 fighting men. The army has been forced back to the frigid Alps and parts of the northern Italian coastline, which are continuously harassed by the British Navy. In spite of possessing some talented generals forged by the revolution, the French Masena. army of Italy has stagnated. Any hope of glory has long since left the rank and file, while the continued losses and a neglectful government threatens to collapse what remains of the army of Italy. Meanwhile, the coalition has been enjoying relative success in Italy. Despite historical guys, I, I really want to get into learning about w what are these called seals. Um, I I, I really want to learn about the different uh, like royal these things these symbols and 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 what they all the things mean. Has been enjoying relative success in Italy. Despite historical grievances, the revolution has united both Piedmont and Austria in an uneasy alliance against France. The rich plains of central Italy keep the 30,000 Austrian and 25,000 Piedmontese soldiers well supplied on the French frontier. Their commanders are experienced, though many are elderly and used to an older, more measured type of warfare. 
Nevertheless, they are confident in plans to push the French out of Italy once and for all. In late March, Bonaparte arrives to take command of the Army of Italy. But he is initially met with resentment by the leading generals. General Bonaparte is much younger, far less accomplished, and lacks experience in command. His appointment is seen as a result of his political connections, frustrating the leading generals, who have earned their rank through hard work and perseverance. It doesn't take long for Bonaparte to assert his control. You've served for one more year, dude. After an initial inspection, the disorderly troops are quickly reorganized and prepared for deployment. Provisions are gathered from all over southern France, and management over the unreliable supply system is immediately improved. Good map. Most importantly, Bonaparte prepares a new, bold plan of attack, which he formulated in the prior two years while making a careful examination of the Italian theater. Months of inaction and poor planning are wiped away replaced by the vision, inspiration, and leadership of their new commander. Bonaparte has brought new life to the army of Italy, but he will need to act fast and decisively in the campaign ahead, or fade into obscurity like the many who came before him. I seek to lead you into the most fertile plains in the world. Rich provinces, great cities will be in your power. They will, there you will find honor, glory, and riches. As winter gives way to spring in 1796, both France and Austria are amassing their forces in preparation for attack. The main Austrian army, led by the 71-year-old General Beaulieu, is concentrating north of the key seaport of Genoa. Beaulieu believes the French are planning an attack on Genoa in order to disrupt coordination with the British Mediterranean Naval Squadron, vital to expel the French from northern Italy. His plan is to use the bulk of his forces to drive out the isolated French garrison at the port of Voltri and maintain control of the northern Italian coastline. But Beaulieu's obsession with an imagined French attack on Genoa leads him to send only 8,000 soldiers with Argento to defend the strategic mountain passes, the only viable connection linking the Austrian and Piedmontese armies. Beaulieu also commands Argento to drive the French from Montenote in hopes of diverting some of the main French army away from Genoa. The two conflicting objectives leave Argento with no option but to break apart his already small force, and he quickly becomes overextended. Fifty miles to the west, General Colley and his 25,000 Piedmontese are to remain dispersed among the many mountain passes, towns, and depots of Piedmont, ready to defend against an anticipated French direct assault. Beaulieu's decision to split up his forces and leave isolated garrisons across the countryside are actions common among generals of the era, but will prove calamitous in the campaign ahead, as Bonaparte introduces a new, fast-paced style of war. Blitzkrieg. Bonaparte, knowing that he will be outnumbered if his opponents are able to combine forces, begins enacting his daring plan. Aware of the Austrian dispositions, he prepares to concentrate his reorganized and reinvigorated army near Savona so they can strike quickly. The army is to advance north. I feel like that's what he does throughout the entire war, just making sure he works in a way to fight one by one by one army rather than, you know, obviously keeping them from, from grouping up. Always the being the underdog, road junction or, at the, Dago, or the not the underdog, exploiting the gap between the Austrian and you know Piedmontese I mean. armies, which Argento struggles to defend. 
With superior numbers, Bonaparte will drive Argento's small forces towards the safety of the main Austrian army further east, before turning back to crush the scattered and now isolated Piedmontese. As dawn broke on the 10th of April, General Beaulieu's troops emerged from the mountain passes surrounding Voltry to assault the French garrison. Despite being heavily outnumbered, the French stubbornly hold until nightfall, whereupon they fall back to rejoin Massena's vanguard near Savona. Massena. General Beaulieu, pleased with his victory and believing he stopped the attack on Genoa, decides not to pursue the fleeing French. He now directs Vukasovic, an aggressive and experienced general, to take 3,500 men and support the overextended Argento. However, Voltri is far from Montenote, and this support will take time to arrive. Can I just say one thing? This channel has 1.77k subs. I'm very impressed at how much it looks and sounds like uh, a Kings and Generals or Epic History TV uh, video. Um, you know, he's got the good the music is coming in at the right time, good audio volume. He's got the really really nice maps and and they're they're unique maps. I haven't or they're maps I haven't seen used in other ones. So he's not just like, uh, and he's got the banners and and everything. Really really well done. Are from Montenote and this support will take time to arrive. To the west, Argento is following Beaulieu's orders to drive the French from Montenote. Although successful in capturing some of the forward French bastions, his effort to storm the main redoubt on Montenegino stalls with heavy losses. Beaulieu's early offensive and capture of Voltri catches Bonaparte by surprise. However, it also reveals that the main Austrian army is far from Bonaparte's line of attack. Reacting rapidly to this intelligence, Bonaparte orders General Augereau to take his main force and head to Melissimo. He then turns his attention to crushing Argento. Divisional Commander La Harpe is sent to reinforce the French defenders on Monte Neguino, while Bonaparte advances up the Bormida Valley with General Massena's vanguard to hit Argento's right flank. Marching through heavy mud and broken trails, Massena's vanguard emerges from thick fog and strikes the exposed Austrian flank, while La Harpe launches a pinning attack from atop Monte Neguino to keep them in place. Argento's forces collapse, having been caught completely off guard. Argento himself leads the escape, as his remaining troops are being routed. Bonaparte, bolstered by his success, orders La Harpe to remain near the battlefield as rear guard, while he and Massena continue on to meet up with the main column. Late on the 12th of April, they unite with General Augereau at Carcaret, but the difficult terrain has left much of Augereau's forces strung out on the road, and most have not yet arrived. Believing the Austrians sufficiently defeated, Bonaparte plans to concentrate his forces for an attack on Cauley's dispersed Piedmontese army before they can unite, while Massena continues on to seize Dago. Augereau, leading the advance against Kali, encounters a small Piedmontese garrison, blocking the main path in the ruins of a castle at Cosaria. The garrison could present a threat to Bonaparte's advance if not dealt with, you so sure? he decides to send Augereau to storm it, rather than waste time bypassing it. Despite Augereau's significant numerical advantage, which is growing as his column begins arriving, the assault is beaten back by the well-fortified defenders, and nearly a thousand French are lost Looks before like the castle finally fort. surrenders the following day. The assault on Caseria proves to be a costly but valuable lesson for Bonaparte, who learns to avoid hasty attacks on fortified positions later in the campaign.
battlefield is a scene of constant chaos. <clears throat> the winner will be the one who controls that chaos, both his own and the enemies. As Caseria is resisting Ojiro, Masena's advance on Dago likewise stalls. Masena is sobered by the Austrians' well-fortified position, and he believes that they have a significant force there. So he decides to wait for the remainder of his division to arrive before taking the village. Bonaparte is also informed that there is an Austrian buildup in Dago. So, he leaves the advance on Piedmont to Ogero in order to return to Dago to support Masena. Sorry. There is an Austrian buildup in Dago. So, he leaves the advance on Piedmont to Ogero in order to return to Dago to support Masena. In fact, it is defended only by the battered remains of Argento's force and a small Piedmontese garrison which anxiously await the arrival of fresh soldiers from Vukasovich. At daybreak on the 14th, Bonaparte, having taken command from Masena, orders the assault to begin. Masena leads a column and a frontal assault on the village. Doesn't Napoleon end up shooting Masena's eye out? Assault to begin. Masena leads a column and a frontal assault on the village. As La Harp outflanks the Austrians to the left, and General La Salette, advancing on the east bank of the Bormida, severs their only path of escape. Outnumbered two to one, and with their only line of retreat under threat, the already demoralized Austrians break and rapidly fall back towards Zaqui. Bonaparte, believing he has once more sent the Austrians into a comprehensive withdrawal, turns his attention back to shattering the Piedmontese taking Masena and some of his division with him. The remaining soldiers from Masena's division are left to occupy the region surrounding Dago and to forage for supplies. Interesting. So he's kind of like, he, he seems to have like three targets, <clears throat> like, <clears throat> excuse me, like three targets at a time, some less important than others. And like he'll attack two on the way sort of and then let other generals kind of take him down a bit and demoralize him or control him somewhat as he goes towards the main target to hit them and if it's successful or even if it's not successful he then just regroups and pushes back to crush the the first two does that make sense and is that right as argento's scattered forces flee Vukasovich finally arrives before dawn the next morning with 3,500 reinforcements. Vukasovich's Austrians catch the remaining French troops at Dago by surprise in the early morning hours, tearing through the scattered and weakened French division. The French flee southwards, abandoning the artillery they had captured the previous day. Once again, Bonaparte turns back to Dago entrusting Ogero and General Surrier with his advance on Piedmont. Bonaparte redirects Masena's and La Harpe's divisions to return with him to Dago. On his return, Masena also gathers his fleeing troops from Dago to rejoin for the attack. French counterattacks begin in piecemeal, as Masena arrives first and is later joined by La Harpe. Fighting sweeps back and forth across the village, but Vukasovich's resolute defense holds late into the afternoon, inflicting heavy losses on the French. Vukasovich had hoped to receive reinforcements from Argento's division once they realized his success in Dago, but Argento's troops are still shaken by their defeat and are in no condition to support Vukasovich. The French numerical superiority begins to show Outnumbered more than four to one, Vukasovich clings on desperately, but cannot stop the French from breaking through and swarming the town. Vukasovich has no option but to retreat and rejoin the main army, concentrating at Aqui. 
Although the Austrian losses were more than double those of the French, the continuous retaking of Dago has cost Bonaparte precious time and compels him to leave behind many additional men to keep watch on the Austrian army. And many has cost Bonaparte precious time and compels him to leave behind many additional men to keep watch on the Austrian army. Once the offensive has been assumed, it must be sustained to the last extremity. Military maxim of Napoleon Bonaparte. As Bonaparte launches his My offensive leader. against the Austrians, General Colley is working tirelessly to concentrate his Piedmontese army. By the morning of the 14th, he has amassed the bulk of his army at Montezamolo. But concerned by French General Surrier's advance from the south, and by news of the initial Austrian defeat at Dago, he decides to pull back to Cheva. Augereau pursues Colley, but after a poorly organized and half-hearted assault, is halted in front of the intimidating Piedmontese defenses. April 16th is a day of rest, reconnaissance, and repositioning for Bonaparte. The following morning, having received confirmation that the Austrians are indeed retreating towards Alessandria, Bonaparte renews his offensive against the Piedmontese. I really gotta uh, pee, guys. I'll be right back. Okay. I'll wash my hands. However, realizing that the renews his offensive against the Piedmontese. However, realizing that the entire French army is concentrating against him and that the Austrians are moving further away, Colley decides to fall back with his main force to an even more imposing defensive position behind the Corsiglia River. He does leave a garrison in the fortress at Cheva, which stubbornly refuses to surrender when the French army arrives. Having learned his lesson at Caseria, Bonaparte simply bypasses the fortress, moving up towards Kali's new position. Bonaparte decides to dislodge Kali from the Corsiglia River with a two-pronged assault. Augereau will attack at the confluence of the Tenaro and Corsiglia rivers, while Surrier, advancing with two columns, will force his way through the village of San Michele. Massena, meanwhile, is to remain in reserve to support these operations. Early in the morning of the 19th, Surrier's division charges towards the San Michele Bridge, while Augereau tries to find another way across the swollen Tenaro River. But the Piedmontese have had time to prepare. Holding the high ground behind an impassable river, Kali's troops are formidable. Surrier's men, forced to rush the bridge, are decimated by Piedmontese cannon fire and are driven back for now. In late morning, a small group of Piedmontese pickets attempting to return to the main army are noticed and followed by French skirmishers who observe them crossing an unguarded aqueduct. The French rush a demi-brigade across and launch a surprise attack from the south, while Surrier renews his attack from the east, successfully taking San Michele. Rather than pressing their advantage, the ill-supplied French, elated by success, descend into undisciplined looting, giving the Piedmontese time to regroup. Just as with Dago, the French are once again caught unaware by a strong counterattack. The thing with looting, and why I'm sure many officers are very, probably like, like if I, if I was an officer, I'd be like, shoot on sight anyone you see looting. Like, in your, own off, your, own, your own soldiers. Because, especially like in, if there's some like policy, I mean like in the middle of a battle. If, if it's like after a battle, maybe a slap on the wrist, or maybe it's allowed to loot. But like in the middle of a battle, because as soon as one guy, as soon as one guy starts looting, then other people are going to see him and want to start looting too. And so you got to stop it at the bud. Surrier's Nip men it at the on the bud. verge of victory are forced into a disorderly retreat back across the river to their starting positions. Bonaparte's attack has failed. His men, hungry, tired, and stung by their recent defeat, are on the verge of mutiny. 
Few supplies can reach the army through the winding mountain passes. Time is Bonaparte's greatest enemy. He needs victory soon, or he will be forced to concede defeat. Kali has his own dilemma. If the French are able to break through or outflank his line, the Piedmontese army will collapse. Even though Beaulieu is turning back from Alessandria to help the Piedmontese, delays in communication leave General Colley believing that the Austrians are too far to provide support. Colley, weighing the strength of his position after the near disaster at San Michele, makes the fateful decision to abandon his defenses on the Corsiglia River in order to find a new defensive line near Mondovi. On the evening of the 20th, the Piedmontese light campfires to conceal their withdrawal. But Bonaparte, suspicious by the lack of activity, has sent scouts across the river who discover the evacuation. Despite the poor condition of his army, Bonaparte views this as his best opportunity to defeat the Piedmontese by catching them before they can establish a new defensive position. By 10 a.m. on the 21st, Surrier's lead brigade descends from the mountain passes around the surprised Piedmontese rearguard. Heavy fighting breaks out, but as the French bring up cannons and grow in numbers, the unprepared Piedmontese crumble, and their general, Dichot, is killed. The remaining soldiers of the rearguard fall back to the protection of the main army. Kali had planned to set up his defense along the river Alera. However, when he arrives, he is dismayed to find the area unsuitable. Difficult terrain and the lack of entrenchments on a position that can be easily outflanked forces Kali to continue on past Mondovi, but his uneasy troops are bottlenecked in the small town and movement is slow. The arrival of the fleeing Piedmontese rearguard and the death of the popular and brave General Dichot are enough to send the army into chaos. Order and discipline collapse as the soldiers hastily begin ransacking their own town before retreating, leaving behind valuable equipment and munitions. A triumphant Bonaparte marches into Mondovi that evening. His troops, reinvigorated by their easy victory, pause at Mondovi for much needed rest and resupply. The two armies which lately attacked the two armies which lately attacked you in full confidence now fly before you in consternation. Excerpt of Bonaparte's proclamation on achieving victory over Piedmont. With his army crumbling and his finances strained, King Victor Amadeus III of Piedmont Sardinia decides to open negotiations with the French in Genoa to bring an end to the war. General Colley, now with only 10,000 men scattered around Kerasco, requests an armistice with Bonaparte. Knowing that Kali's forces are broken and demoralized, Bonaparte refuses and instead demands harsh concessions while continuing the invasion into the heart of Piedmont. Generals Ogero and Massena begin a joint advance up the Tanaro River towards Kerasco, while Surrier captures Trinita. Where's Believing Suchet? his army too weak to hold back the French, Colley initiates yet another difficult retreat to Carmagnola, just 12 miles south of the capital. His exhausted army drags itself through relentless rain and bitter cold as they make their retreat. Good job. The tattered remains of the army finally begin gathering at Carmagnola, but the Piedmontese are in no condition to fight as the French continue their relentless advance. On the I, I say good job, just like with the sound of the... I'm very... Good job on making this video. Uh, very impressive. 25th of April, the French take Kerasco. And the following day, Bonaparte enters Alba. Meanwhile, La Harpe is pushing towards Zaqui with his division, threatening to engage with Beaulieu's unsupported forces. Beaulieu who has been preparing to assist Kali's ragged army, is furious to learn the Piedmontese attempts at negotiation with Bonaparte. The uneasy alliance between Austria and Piedmont falls apart as Beaulieu begins preparations for a retreat across the Po River, 
ransacking his former allies' villages along the way. Without the support of the Austrians, and with his army now completely unable to resist the French onslaught, King Victor has no alternative but to capitulate to Bonaparte's demands. The Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. I really like being able to see... Um, so I love maps, obviously. I love maps. And the animations and whatnot. But I really like, really like seeing obstacles that, that would be... Or, or things on maps that would be obstacles to, to uh, invaders, to armies, like rivers and mountains and valleys and whatnot. And this one... I, I, probably the best channel in terms of showing where the, ri the, the rivers which is really important, it really stands out, and this is very good. ...is forced to give up territory, hand over control of strategic fortresses and bridges to the French, provide munitions and other supplies to Bonaparte's army, and allow unrestricted French movement to cross their territory. Napoleon Bonaparte in the span of two short weeks, has delivered a much-needed military triumph to France. Hard work, coupled with the promise of riches and glory, has transformed undisciplined, ill-equipped soldiers into a formidable force that inflicted nearly 12,000 casualties, almost twice its own losses, across six battles. His bold planning, innovative tactics, and speed of operations has led to the destruction of Piedmont's entire army and the abrupt retreat of the Austrians. The rapid success of this campaign provides an early glimpse of what will come. Bonaparte's military mastery will eventually propel him to become one of history's greatest conquerors. Uh, this video was inspired by Epic History TV's Napoleonic War series. You did a really good job. I would highly recommend viewers watch their videos if they have not already done so. I have. For those interested, please see the link in the description. Really good. Um, so awesome. I like, you know, going through redundancy with Napoleon. Um, I'm starting to, I, I'm getting that extra fire uh, in me when it comes to wanting to learn about Napoleon. Uh, since originally learned, I, I feel like I'm ready to enter the next step of wrecking. I'm talking nonsense. I, I, that's how I learn, but very good job. PMF productions. If this, so I, I'm going to give you, I'm, I'm going to give one, not even a critique. And this is a, this is of love. I, I, I think you have a lot going here and is that, um, your, your voice is very good and everything, but it, it's. If you were, you know how like Kings and Generals and Epic History TV have those like powerful guys, like those voices. Um, if you inserted those narrators, and I know this is your channel and you want to be the uh, narrator, and it was really good. You were really good. Don't get me wrong. Um, but th I'm trying to say as a compliment, if, if you were to just replace your voice with their voices from like Epic History TV or Kings and Generals, I would not have noticed that this was not a Kings and Generals or Epic History TV video. Does that make sense? Extremely good. Well done and awesome. I learned a lot. Thank you. Solidifying it in my mind. See you guys next time.